Glad to have everyone back. May I present Dr. Eliza Grames, who will be presenting the Entogen project. Dr. Eliza Grames recently completed her PhD in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Connecticut and is now a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Nevada, Reno. Her research focuses on developing new methods of ev evidence synthesis to cope with the explosion of scientific literature and applying these methods to bird and insect conservation and ecology. The goal of the Entogen project is to develop a publicly accessible living systematic map database that can be used to assess the current state of evidence in the scientific literature regarding insect declines, increases, or lack of changes over time. With that, take it away, Dr. Grames. Thanks so much, TJ, for inviting me to be here, for everyone for coming. Um, so insects are really, really fascinating to me. I mean, they're incredibly diverse. They fill so many um, functional roles, so much cool morphology, and they're really important for ecosystem services. Um, but like so much biodiversity, insects are under threat from a variety of different um, drivers, you know, habitat loss, degradation, light pollution, water pollution, climate change, all sorts of things affect insect populations. And so people are really concerned about um, the possible loss of biodiversity of insects and insect declines globally. And this has been kind of a big issue for the last couple of years, um, especially where people have been paying attention to it. And so you may have seen the headlines a few years ago, you know, the insect apocalypse this year, where it was really getting mainstream attention. Um, and, you know, people are saying, how can people help to, um, you know, mitigate insect loss? You know, when is this going to be happening? Um, what kind of uh, downstream effects could this have for other species? You know, what could be causing this? What are some of the main drivers? Um, you know, this could have huge ecological impacts. And so people are really concerned. It's really dramatic. You know, the headlines are right up there with what's going on on reality TV. It's, it's that dramatic. Um, and of course, this is a big overstatement here. I'm not actually sure that anything in this title here is true, um, but it's really an issue that's kind of catapulted into the public's attention. And so, of course, you know, we need to consider what evidence there is for insect decline because we know, you know not all species can be declining, um, and it's really important to consider the evidence. And so, there was a review that came out back in 2019 that was looking for drivers of decline. Um, and they looked at about 70 studies, mostly in the US and Europe, um, and kind of concluded that pesticides were the main thing. But they also calculated that about 40% of species were going extinct this century, which if that you know strikes a little chord as being probably too many, you're right. Um, so they have really biased methods in how they um, did their review and the analysis. Um, and so that was kind of a problem. And then a year later, a meta-analysis came out that actually did a formal meta-analysis looking for declines and increases and figure out, you know, what are insect community diversity trends over time? Um, and of course, you know, they found some species are declining pretty quickly and some are doing okay. And so we're seeing, you know, a lot of differences. And so that's where it gets really important to figure out, you know, what are the drivers and where should we be concerned about um, insect loss versus areas that insects are doing pretty well. But even though they had, it, uh, I think it was 168 studies in this meta-analysis, we know that they're missing at least 100 studies that have 10 or more years of insect community data because um, we found them through the Entogen project. And so, you know, that makes me think, why are we missing so many studies when there's so many people working on this topic and it's so important? Um, and so I think really the main reason is that there's just so much evidence out there. So, you know, this graph could apply to basically any discipline. Um, there's just an you know, exponential increase in how many publications are published each year. Um, and so it's really hard to cope with that amount of evidence. So what I want to talk about today is about how we can make global syntheses. So questions on global topics or really broad topics, how can we make them more global, which um, I mean, a couple of things with that, but especially how do we find the data outside of North America and Europe um, and actually do things so that they're really systematic and exhaustive. And so for that, I think we need community engagement, which I'm going to talk about, um, technology and software to discover research. We need to be more efficient in how we actually extract data from studies and classify them. Um, and I think we need more uh, multilingual syntheses to capture um, articles that are published in languages other than English. 
So I'm going to talk about these through the um, case study of Entogen, but the same principles kind of apply broadly across fields. So when I say that we need a community-driven approach to synthesis, I mean that you know we actually want the community to drive this. We don't want the project to be crowdsourced labor, um, which a lot of people will do. Um, and so we want participants to drive the synthesis process where you know, they are coming up with the protocols, the planning, and the results, and really it's a community effort. It's not one research team kind of pushing things forward. Everyone is invited to participate. Um, and then we want the final database project um, to be completely open and accessible for anyone to access that data and have the information that they need to really understand what's going on with insect populations. Um, and then to use the data from that database, we want the community to develop guidelines so no one feels like their data is being misused. Um, so to, whoops, advanced a little too far there. Um, so we got a bunch of uh, uh, evidence synthesis, meta-analysts, entomologists, conservation biologists together to develop the first protocol. We got a little funding from CISREV to fund some of the early screening, which was great. Um, and we came up with this huge, massive protocol of um, how we wanted to go about doing this systematic map. And then we registered the um, protocol and open science framework. Um, we really wanted to not miss anything, so we identified about 1,500 synonyms for insects, including all sorts of different taxonomic groups. Um, and then we also came up with um, five different outcome groups. So we were looking for population abundances, changes in occurrence, so like presence, absence, changes in biomass, diversity, or geographic range. Um, and then we wanted these to be long-term time series, but we're actually cataloging anything that's at least two years of data, because um, you can learn a lot. If you have a lot of small data sets, but there's a lot of them over two years, you can kind of pick up on trends that way. Um, and so once we registered the protocol, we started trying to distribute it broadly to get feedback from people. And so we started getting feedback from around the world, though again, we've got kind of a bias towards the US and Europe. Um, and people were suggesting ways that we could modify the protocol to make it um, even better. So for example, one of the really helpful comments we got is someone said, you should really be including um, studies of insecticides because if they have control plots, that's essentially monitoring data. And so we found a lot of studies that way where it is, you know, just long-term monitoring on a control plot, trying to figure out, you know, if you can uh, reduce species on the treatment plots with insecticides. So that was really helpful. Um, and so after all of this, we did all of our searches, deduplicated things, and we had 143,862 unique articles to sort through, um, which is a Pretty big number. Um, if you've done a systematic review, you're probably not wanting to see this number pop up. Um, and so that's where I think we really need software and development of evidence synthesis technology to support really broad synthesis topics. And I'm going to talk about three packages that you can use for like pre processing data before uploading to SysRev um, that kind of speeds up that process. Um, so first, we use the R package lit searcher to identify search terms to try to make our search as broad as possible. And so we fed in a couple hundred articles that we knew were relevant from previous um, reviews. And then lit searcher pulls out all of these terms highlighted in blue as possible keywords. Um, and to remove the ones that aren't relevant, like Southwest Germany, for example, it puts everything into this keyword co-occurrence network where the most important terms float to the center, and there are these bubbles in the center, are the really important keywords, and the less important ones are these like peripheral nodes. And so then you just select the ones that are the most important and use those for your search. And then once we had all of our search results across all of our databases, of course, you have to <laughs> bring everything together into one central database. So we use the R package synthesizer which lets you read bibliographic data files directly into R, manipulate them, and process them with like standard text processing packages, um, which is good for removing duplicate records across databases so you don't you know, end up screening them twice. Um, and then the other nice thing is once you have your entire um, set of articles in R, you can then kind of manipulate it with other um, packages. So we use the R package topic tagger to um, automatically tag some of the article metadata because we knew that there are a lot of studies that we were going to get back that aren't relevant because if you search for changes in the abundance of insects, 
You also get things like changes in gene abundance in Drosophila, which we're not really interested in. Um, and so what Topic Taker does is it takes some kind of user-defined scheme. So this could be a taxonomy or phylogeny or a dictionary of terms and how they're related. And then it takes them based on that um, user-defined scheme so you can try to figure out what topic an article is on. And so we use this to do um, geotagging so we can figure out the relative abundance of studies and frequency per country. Um, so we knew kind of what the geographic scope of the evidence base that we were starting with was before we were even able to go through and screen them manually. So, you know, we know there's a lot of studies from the U.S., the U.K., Japan, Australia, and Brazil. Um, and we also gave it a dictionary, well, a taxonomy of insects to figure out, you know, what are the main taxonomic groups that we're dealing with? And so the main one that we have is Lepidoptera, which is moths and butterflies and then beetles, flies, bees and wasps, and bugs. Um, and so that's really helpful for us to just get a sense of what's really in this, you know, huge set of articles where we don't have time, obviously, to screen all 143,000 right away, so we can kind of prioritize things based on this automatic tagging when we know a little bit about what's in our database. And so we cut down our total list of 143,000 to uh, just over 7,000 by tagging the articles that had the best terms for long-term time series, because those are the ones that people are most interested in. And so that's the data set that we then uploaded to CISREV for the first project um, in the first phase of Entogem, which is to have uh, community members screen these articles and figure out which ones actually meet the criteria of being a long-term insect population time series and which ones don't. Um, and then we use those decisions to prioritize the remaining, you know, 130 some thousand articles so that we're working through strategically prioritizing articles, kind of like if you use the, um, you know, review include, review exclude um, predictors within CISREV, basically we're taking data out of CISREV and doing it on the articles that we haven't uploaded yet. Um, and this is really just to improve the efficiency and reduce time and effort. So we fit topic models who, whether or not articles were definitely excluded, maybe included, or definitely included. And if we use a cutoff of about, you know, 20% probability of being included, we can exclude a lot of the articles that users said should be excluded while still keeping a lot of the ones that um, should be included. And so we can do, you know, like an receiver curve here and see that at about 21%, if we ex make that our cutoff for probability of inclusion, we're missing, we're going to eliminate about 80% of the articles that aren't relevant while only excluding about 22% of the articles that are relevant. And we can keep improving these models over time as people keep screening on CISRA to find those remaining 20% that we eliminated already. Um, so we can take our automatic uh, tags for the different taxonomic groups, plus these um, trained models that predict which articles are most likely to be included, and we subset our whole database into articles on hymenopterans, which is like bees and wasps and ants, and then on odonates, which is uh, dragonflies and damselflies. And so we have those two projects running concurrently, and the results of each of them will feed back into the main Entogem database, but this way we can, you know, make some progress on these subsets in the meantime. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on is multilingual synthesis, because um, I think this is a really important thing that, um, you know, we're all aware of that there's a lot of articles out there published in languages other than English, but I think the barrier to actually doing those searches prevents a lot of people from including other languages. Um, and so in literature, there's a function that actually suggests how many journals are published exclusively in languages other than English on the topic that you're studying. And so for insect conservation, you know, there's 247 uh, journals that are published only in Russian that might have data that is relevant to this topic. Um, but of course, it's really hard to search in these languages, and so we want people who are native speakers of languages other than English to run these sub projects. Um, and what's great is we have collaborators now who are uh, we're working with to develop 
um, Entegem projects uh, focused on Spanish, Portuguese, and Japanese, so we'll be able to capture a lot more of the global literature. And of course, we're always looking for collaborators who want to run um, projects in other languages. Um, and across all of this work so far, we found at least 100 uh, data sets with more than 10 years of insect data that have not been included in any of the previous um, syntheses, so reviews or meta-analyses of insect decline. Um, and that was when we hit about 5% of the article screen, so we've got a lot more that we are still finding. Um, I wanted to show you just briefly, because this is one of my favorite parts, what those look like. So this is what a lot of the data that we find looks like. It's, you know, from the 1930s and 40s, and it's, you know, this is what, 10 years of every two months monitoring fly populations in Tanzania. But in this format, the data isn't really that useful, so we use this R package meta digitized to turn it into an actual data set that you could analyze in R. This is not the best model to fit to these data, but it just gives you kind of a sense of some of the trends that we're finding in these. So, you know, some species um, and populations are increasing with a lot of fluctuation. Um, some have these big, you know, cycles. Um, we also get some that are just showing really steep declines. Um, some species where every couple of years you get kind of an unpredictable increase. Um, some populations showing no trends at all over time. Um, some increasing with a lot of fluctuation. And then, you know, again, increasing a lot of fluctuation. These are butterflies in Uganda. And then this is my favorite data set that we found so far because it's almost 30 years of monitoring a single population of black flies at one lake in Iceland. Um, but it's just because they're duck food. So the authors who have collected this data are studying the duck population there and they're monitoring the insects as a food source. Um, but it's this really great long-term time series telling us a lot about how insects are doing. Um, so kind of the future directions for uh, the Antigen project is we want to make a living systematic map database so as we go through and tag things, people can access that in real time. Um, so I'm working with a couple of people who are really good at developing shiny apps to make an app where people can go in and actually work with the data. So you know they can select which taxa they want to display, how long the study should be, they can look at where studies are located geographically, they can look at histograms or heat maps, or they just download the original data set and use it that way. Um, so that's still kind of in development. Um, we also want more methods of being able to find research and contribute data to that. So having people be able to, you know, say, I collected this data for my dissertation, it's unpublished, but there's three years of beetle data from this um, random spot in Wisconsin or something like that. Um, so that it can get into the map in a different way. Uh, we also want more community contributions and data sharing, so expanding the number of people who are involved in participating and who want to get involved in this whole process. Um, and of course, we want to have more projects in languages other than English, just adopting the Antigen framework, applying it to um, their region or language, and then merging everything back together into this big global database. Um, and then, of course, once we have the database up and running, we want people to actually use it um, for their reviews and doing meta-analyses. Um, so I guess with that, I'm happy to take any questions people have about Entogen or evidence synthesis in general. Well, thanks, Eliza. That was great. Um, you know, we often think that we see the behind the scenes just as a developer of Cistro, but definitely running through all the different packages that you use just to set it up, um, a, a new perspective on what behind the scenes means. So thank you. That was really interesting. Um, everyone, please save your questions. We're going to have the Q&A start real shortly. Uh, please don't go anywhere. Thank you again, Dr. Grames. That was great.